For those of you who didn't hear, ladies and gentlemen, there is a free bar at the end of this afternoon when we've all finished, which means you don't have to pay any money, which is, I absolutely mean this. This isn't some sort of con. This is just a bribe to keep you all here until we've finished. Um, okay. I'm now going to introduce you to our next panel, and the, uh, the chairman of the panel is Martin Watkins. Martin has had 25 years' experience as a market practitioner and advisor with leading exchanges, infrastructure firms, the big four consultancies, and global technology firms. He's a board member of the Chartered Institute of Securities and Investment uh, Management and uh, EM, EMEIA lead for exchanges and financial markets infrastructure at EY. So I'll turn to hand you over now to Martin Watkins. Martin. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, the very nice uh, off-putting element is I've got a clock that's down here in red says minus nine minutes, 50 seconds. <laughs> but I do understand that's actually uh, sort of the reminder that uh, Professor Michael Manelli does have deep pockets and short arms and wants to escape paying for all the alcohol afterwards. So uh, it, it's my pleasure to be here, here today. I'm going to very quickly introduce the, the members of the, um, of the panel. Um, we'll go in, uh, in, in order going across. We have uh, Matt Gill, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Millennium IT, uh, a capital market software firm I'm sure many of you know, which is owned by the London Stock Exchange. Um, Matt started in the industry in fintech back in 94 as, uh, when he launched a derivatives uh, software house and he went on to become president of SunGuard Technology Services. Next to Mac is Johan uh, Toll. Uh, Johan is the associate vice president and uh, product manager for blockchain over at NASDAQ within the market technology business. He spent a lot of his time originally at NASDAQ in trading and post-trade and has moved on to become responsible for their blockchain technology. Um, and previously, he was also at SunGuard, uh, where he was uh, responsible for Front Arena order management systems. Now, before I go any further, I just need to quickly mention that EY are the global auditors for both the London Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. So I do have to mention that. As far as I'm concerned, you all need to make sure that I both treat them both fairly, but actually treat everyone else even better. <laughs> um, uh, Johan also has a flight to catch um, from, uh, to Stockholm. So because we're running slightly late, when we get to quarter two, which is why I will be looking at my watch, um, Johan will make, uh, make his apologies because he needs to get to Heathrow in time to fly back. But uh, we very much appreciate that you've made the effort to come up and uh, sit in two panels today. Thank you. Um, moving further along, we've got Chris Lees. Um, uh, Chris founded a company called um, FixSpec in 2012, uh, which is a firm designed to, to build, uh, build IT and tools that can help firms connect more easily. Um, an organization or a, 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 a startup that actually is still self-funded. Um, and before that, he was the product manager at exchanges, investment banks, and software vendors, including some of those represented here on the panel. And Sangard. And Sangard. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Um, Three Sangards. <laughs> and to uh, Sangard. <laughs> and, and, and to balance at the at the, at the far end, um, uh, Hiranda Misra, who's the um, co-founding group chairman or, and chief executive of, GM, of GMX Group. Um, they've obviously recently subdivided into two organizations, and I believe Hiranda has involvement in both. Uh, he spends a lot of his time helping firms to deliver change in market structure, trading, and regulatory compliance. Um, and before that was the co-founder and chief operating officer of ChaiX Europe. And at the time that um, Hiranda moved on to, uh, to his next role, they were already sitting as the number two in the equities market uh, in Europe. So I'm delighted to have such a strong panel because it means I don't have to talk very much. Um, I'm going to go through first, Mac, the major trends you're seeing in fintech IT innovation. What are you seeing out there that's going to actually make a difference in the next 18 months, two years? OK, Martin, uh, first, great, great to be here. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's, I think when we look at 2016, it's really going to be seen as a tipping point in many ways for, for fintech, and we can talk about so many reasons why. But, you know, so it's been an exciting time even before, you know, volatility became the new normal, right, with Brexit and uh, uh, President-elect Trump. Actually, it's the first time I've actually said that. Um, <laughs> you for the, for the record, I may have lived in New York for 20 years, but I am Canadian. So I want to set that straight at the beginning. Um, so, you know, we're dealing with, with a lot of, well, again, the new normal volatility. I mean, volumes have been incredibly high, record volumes, 
not just after Brexit, but uh, you know, close on, on certainly on the order side yesterday. So resilience is incredibly important right now. And you talk about you know, relatively short term. I mean, there's a lot of focus right now on making sure that the systems are working and that we have fluid and stable capital markets. And uh, so I think that will take a lot of mind share, continue to take a lot of mind share in the next little while. And you know, we're doing about a third of all European equity flow on our systems uh, right now. And so we're very focused on taking that, taking that forward. But, but when you look at 2016, I mean, to me, when I think about fintech, it's really not just about any one of the things where a lot of us are talking about with you know, DLT or cloud or agile or open source. It's, it's about the convergence, the confluence of all of these together. They're very synergistic. And each one of them in their own right, I think would be quite dynamic and have quite an impact on, on our industry, but the fact that they're all coming together at the same time means that we're going to be experiencing changes faster than any of us in our you know, 20, 20 plus years, 30 years of experience of, have, have, got, have grown accustomed to. And, um, and I think that partly also explains a lot of the M&A activity that we're seeing right now. Major deals that we, you know, that are in the works, CBOE, uh, and, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot of change. But, um, so I mean, I'm sure we'll have the discussion about other, you know, specific trends, but to me it's, it's the fact it's all happening together. But let me come back, to, you give a very short time frame on, you know, the next 12, 18 months and the main trend. To me, when, when I look at the main trend, that it, right in terms of impact, I'm very excited right now about hardware acceleration. And we're doing, along with the rest of the industry, a lot of work with FPGAs and GPUs, and I think the, you know, the, not just the performance that we're seeing from that, and we're kind of, we talk about the, you know, helping us move from microseconds to nanoseconds with, with hardware acceleration. But more importantly, back to my point about operational risk, it's about stability. And so the fact that we can implement a system with very deterministic speed. And so we went live at the London Stock Exchange Group earlier this year with a new ticker plant uh, called a new market data platform that was FPGA enabled. And now we have, you know, three, four, five microsecond uh, performance, but also, again, very deterministic. Um, that's just one example. We're building a, a risk management platform for, LC, for LCH, cross-asset, using GPUs, the ability to, to run huge numbers of calcs, right, that we couldn't do in a pre-GPU, you know, in a pure software environment. These are things that are, that are moving the dial, again, in the next 12 to 18 months. And so, again, I, I remain very excited about that aspect. But again, it's one of four or five major areas that are, that are, that are coming together right now. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much. For, and uh, I think what we're going to want to do is also come back and look at some of the challenges that we face and, and to make sure we don't go from one exchange to another, that we keep it um, more open than that. Um, uh, Hiranda, from your perspective, you often get to start with the new things. How are we going to start something up and how are we going to change it? Sure. Well, what's, what, what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, uh, I usually get bored of the status quo, but actually now is the greatest opportunity uh, for uh, innovation. And actually, I mean, I, I'd say from where we see things, um, hybrid is of the order of the day, and we're not really talking about sort of cars or car engines here. So, you know, everyone talks about kind of disruptive technologies and, and the new world versus the old. And um, most people are naive in thinking that, you know, overnight the old world is going to be replaced by, by the new world. Actually, I mean, to some extent, Mac mentioned convergence. I mean, that, that, that holds true. I mean, so for example, all right, it's dying down now, the hype cycle around uh, blockchain, for example. But as with one large bank uh, last week, uh, because we're doing a lot um, in emerging markets and we're looking at various use cases, both uh, what we'd say traditional, but also um, disruptive and distributed ledger based. But they said that within the bank, that even though they've invested in a range of these initiatives, that there's a personal acknowledgement that it's not going to happen anytime soon in the developed markets, um, apart from some of the peripheral aspects of that related to KYC ML. But actually, they see a real opportunity of that in emerging markets almost as a live proof of concept. Um, but equally, you, you know, I mean, there's a lot of hype out there where you get these announcements. Um, some of them, or a lot of them, vaporware. Where um, you know, I think there's one NC. I've got the name announced a couple of weeks ago that, that they've got a clearing model now, and it's going to be the death knell of um, CCPs. <laughs> but but actually, 
you know, when we're transacting together and it's bilateral, great, but what happens if it goes wrong? You know, and then again, I think this is where hybrid comes in. The role of intermediaries doesn't go away and harnessing kind of new technology or best of breed technology with existing centralized technology is key in a way that kind of creates revenue opportunities and um, lowers costs. Um, and, and we've seen that, you know, I mean, one of the recent announcements we made was around kind of voice electronic kind of central limit order book hybrid technology working with um, the interdealer broker Telet Prebon, although Dan Marcus said we're not allowed to call them interdealer brokers anymore, I guess. And there, it, it's, it's a combination of kind of merging a number of different technologies, some antiquated, some more modern, uh, and coming up with a kind of holistic workflow, um, you know, like we were discussing prior to that, around multiple asset classes, but also looking at costs at the same time. Oh, thank you for that. And uh, Johan, please. Yes, sure. So, I think we, we definitely saw during the day today that we live in a global world, an international world, and also, I mean, the, we talk about the elections of Trump, we talk about Brexit, and, and we see markets reacting across the globe. So clearly, we live in a global world now where we see markets are going to be more and more harmonized and talking to each other. I think we also had a bunch of FX guys up here before us, and we see there's multi-asset classes that needs to be traded in different systems. Um, so f for us, it's very important to be able to support these kind of, of, of patterns. And blockchain gives us, for example, the possibility to, to work together, to collaborate across markets, across the zones. And uh, our belief is, I mean, the only constant thing is change, more or less. We're going to see there's going to be continuous rapid change across the industry. So you need to have systems to support that change. And in terms of fintech, uh, we are very much investing now in the, in the cloud business to see, I mean, how could we make more efficient businesses? How can we make more efficient markets by using cloud, cloud services? Another big area is data. We, I think we briefly touched on that uh, today as well, about data and analytics. Very, very important because data becomes more and more a strategic asset for you. And now with the new techniques uh, coming out from, from the machine learning and machine intelligence, uh, we can draw much more advanced analytics something we launched from Nasdaq now a couple of days ago called the Trading Insights, where we can help the traders to actually help them and see how well did they actually trade during the day in the market and were there any missed opportunities that they actually performed. And then for sure, FPDA, very, very important, as Mac mentioned, uh, helps us to speed up the data. And then, I mean, distributed ledger technology is for sure interesting fact for the future here. And also, I mean, in the t coming 12 to 18 months, I think we're going to see all of those evolve significantly. Yeah. No, thank you for that. Uh, Chris, we're going to make sure that we don't have four panelists agreeing too much as we go through. <laughs> OK. What's your perspective? <laughs> so I, I think that as consumers nowadays, we've all got um, somewhat addicted to the bright, shiny object. You know, Apple bring out their new iPhone, and everybody convinces themselves they they don't know how they lived without a retina display or something like that. I actually think if you, if you think about financial services institutions, banks, exchanges, clearing houses, and so much, and so on and so on, they all have this burden of legacy technology and legacy processes. For a long, long time, it's always been, here's a new piece of regulation. How am I going to deal with that? Uh, I'm just going to put this, make it this person's job. Right? And so you've got internally a lot of legacy junk that needs to be dealt with. Um, I think that particularly in Europe with MIFID II coming along, there's going to be yet more of those operational items. Uh, and eventually, the banks in particular, because their burden falls very heavily on them, uh, they're going to feel as if they need to sort out their legacy debt, legacy technology debt first, before they can start to invest in some of these more bright and shiny objects. Um, it's not sexy, I know. <laughs> right to, to get rid of that Excel sheet and move it to something else. But every, t every time I go into a bank, I have yet more and more conversations about replacing those legacy manual processes with something a little bit more automated. And it's not rocket science. Yeah, Martin, I know you want, uh, you want to get some action. I mean, violent agreement with, uh, <laughs> with Haran around the word hybrid. And, and to this point, too, because I mean, I was just talking to a CIO of, of a major exchange, not to be named, um, not in Europe, um, who's investing in a new mainframe. Uh, and his view is, I mean, at the same time, he's having, you know, he's, he's looking at DLT and it's a whole range of, of different technologies. But on the mainframe side, the stability, um, you know, you just, there, are certain, there are certain elements of, of, the, of the workflow that they just 
want to maintain. So I think we're all going to be playing with the hybrid, the hybrid role. And again, it comes down to how liquid is the asset class? Um, you know, can it go on the cloud? Can it go into a DLT environment? And some, some will and some can in the next few years. Others won't. Cash equities isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Yep. So, I mean, again, we're going to come into this, this kind of a different, this different model. I mean, I, hybrid is, is really the right word. No, thank you for that. And that, that actually brings me nicely onto the, onto the second piece because we had a discussion uh, earlier on uh, today which was talking about the fact that a number of organizations already have forced the move towards multi-asset systems. But they'd also recognized, and it, 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 it's seen, that the fixed income market and fixed income trading is not the same as equity trading and so on. And you've, you've got this, this element of how do you actually force if there, if there is the, the, the importance of getting cost down, efficiency up, combining teams, as we heard, we heard earlier today, if that's feasible and if that's being done, what's the compromise and what's the, uh, what, what's the problem that you're then going to create or you're then going to have to, 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 to manage? And uh, Chris, I, from a I user think, perspective. I think there's a lot of shoehorning going on. Mm -hmm. Right, so you know, my particular niche, which is about uh, onboarding, right? In in equities, we've had fix for a very long time. Everybody gets it. Everybody understands what fix is, even though fix isn't a single thing. It's everybody's flavour of fix. Now you have fixed income moving towards fix for the first time, and FX is a little bit further ahead in the curve. Um, and what you see is a number of the banks, for example, saying, "Well, let's just merge all of these fix onboarding teams together." Right? And you end up with very highly skilled people who are trying to juggle asset classes as well as completely disparate internal legacy systems, which often behave in very different ways. And it just becomes another thing that somebody's, you know, another job that somebody has, which makes a great sort of uh, risk perspective for the banks if that person leaves. Right? You've got problems with you know, <coughs> physical human knowledge being in one person's head and walking out the door one day. Um, but it also it means that you know you end up with very little consistency because people are just working seven to seven just to keep the lights on. They're not actually improving any of the processes. They're just executing those processes, which is why I think that the future for a lot of those banks is to start investing in standardizing their technology, internally standardizing the workflows internally to allow those people to become more efficient. And when you do that, you strip out a load of cost, but you also release those people to do other things which are more meaningful for the bank. Yeah, I, mean, that, I mean, that's where there is an opportunity because equally, it is non-standardized. And um, with these fixed income markets, uh, I mean, we know central limit order book isn't the answer. And whether, you know, as with, um, we're doing some work in Vietnam and we were with uh, the government and the Hanoi Exchange there, and they were complaining about lack of liquidity in government and corporate bonds, but actually we hear that in the, in the developed world as well. But I mean, this is where actually some of the innovators out there, it affords them an opportunity because the banks are struggling with that. There's, a, there's simple things like data synchronization as well as kind of connectivity across all these platforms. So, um, you know, there are folk trying to get into this. So uh, some of the ex-guys from LMAX have founded something called Transfic. Um, and they're looking at sort of aggregating these disparate kind of fixed income pools um, and not, not as a trading venue play, but, but more as a connectivity play um, that then kind of provides seamless access across these multiple pools, uh, be they third party platforms um, or bank platforms as well. So, so I guess that, that's one thing, but equally, you know, to just touch upon a point that Matt said, you know, when we, when we looked at FX options, for example, with this Tullet project as a, as a first asset class, all right, great, you've got at, at the money options, and that's great, they're very liquid, central limit order books are great, but, but actually you've got a lot of out of the money options, um, and to get exposure to those, actually it doesn't work, and you need RFQs, but actually beyond that as well, um, uh, what, what, you, what you need is, I mean, it almost goes back, uh, I mean, we, we had this, I remember, at Instanet, when I, when I first started, there in um, 1999 or wh whenever it was, um, we, we had negotiations and we, we had a platform that, that kind of links the street and allowed you to kind of seek out 
liquidity. And that was through a combination of means, whether it's phone, so OTC, whether it was negotiations, um, whether it was a form of RFQ, or whether it was kind of more electronic. And we're heading back to that, especially with um, a lot of these kind of non-standardized asset classes. But we're also seeing more non-standardized asset classes emerge because you know we're talking about digitalization but actually many of these things are what we call either one-off assets or, or not liquid like we'd like spot fx or equities are for example yeah no, thank you Johan, please yeah sure so we, we definitely see how the exchange and the market operators clearinghouse exchanges csds they all look for to, to support multi-asset classes when they go and acquire systems so it's a very very important factor for them and not only from a debt perspective, also from a risk perspective. I mean, now you're, you're talking about enterprise risk. How can, how can you provide a good system that you actually have a full control of, of the risk here? So for us, it's been, been very important to support multiple asset classes in the systems. And I think it's going to continue. I mean, we all see how markets are looking into, I mean, the FX side as well now. Could FX be a potential to add on into existing marketplaces? And when are you allowed to do cross margin between the asset classes? How, how efficient are you allowed to become when, I mean, handling multiple asset classes? Because you can, you can be very, very efficient if you start to, from a clearinghouse perspective, handle multiple asset classes. But then it's a question, how far can you go? Because if there is a, a default in the market, then are you able to resolve the situation once that's occurred? If you're too efficient in cross margin, for example, you're going to end up maybe having problems to, to, to clear out in a proper way. But multi-asset is definitely here to stay, and uh, I think it's gonna, we're going to see how that evolves more and more. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Mike, do you have yeah, anything about Yeah, Martin, it's definitely a hot topic, and, and you know, we're seeing that just like my colleagues here um, you know, with exchanges around the world. The, uh, I, mean, I don't think we need to talk about the cost or the efficiency angle. I think we all get that. It's, it's just intuitive. But one of the, the key elements that, that our clients are looking at is actually performance as well, because it's very, especially in, 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 a, in the highly liquid HFT um, markets where we have, you know, you have the underline and the derivatives. Having the same markets, or, you know, or having these markets on the same platform with the same deterministic performance can be, can be highly impactful to, you know, to, to the sell side. And so we see real benefit to our exchange clients providing that kind of environment. So we're working, for example, with the, um, the JSE in, in South Africa doing you know, precisely that right now. So I think we've had a lot of, you've kind of had the horses for courses, you know, approach for the past, you know, 10, 20 years. And, but in the last couple of years, the, the dialogue really changed into, again, it's driven by cost, but it's really, the, the business impact is even more interesting, I think, in terms of, in terms of performance. No, thank you for that. And I, and I think this is it's going to be interesting to see how we get on to the subject of, of actually the drive for liquidity and for relieving some of the other issues in SFR, uh, risk-weighted assets, uh, LCRs and so on, and how that actually may play also into, into the technology. But I'm, I'm going to take a break for one moment. I'm just going to ask Johan, because we are at about the time you've got to go, relative to what you're seeing, um, we know you've put a blockchain in already. We know you've had other issues, and I don't just want to talk about the blockchain. From your perspective, what's the other key message you'd like to leave here around what you're seeing, what's important, and um, how we need to respond to it? From a perspective? From, from your own perspective, you can, you can pick on blockchain if you like, or you can pick on actually how you're handling the multi-asset uh, dimension of, of attracting more business. I think what's unique with blockchain that we'd like to market here for this group is very much collaboration. I think it's an excellent opportunity to collaborate across markets, across peers, and, and see how could we maybe jointly, even though we to some extent compete with each other, how could we jointly agree on, uh, on standards for, for, for sharing information with each other, sharing ledger. Also, we have an initiative going on within NASDAQ we're happy to share with about could we maybe make the, the uh, exchange of collaterals more efficient by using collaterals. Maybe a perfect example for how the bank industry can come together with the market operators and actually make something much more efficient. To, to collectors today, today is a pain to, to move. It, it costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, <laughs> involves a lot, lot of risk. So that's for sure is something very, very interesting for us. Lovely. No, thank you for that. And, and do excuse the brief uh, distraction to move, move on to that subject, because I know that you do actually need to have to go now. Otherwise, yeah, we're going to be <laughs> keeping you from the, from the plane. I'll be back. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you.
Can we talk about him now? You can <laughs> not only him. talk about him, right. you can talk about <laughs> I would wait till he's left the church. <laughs> Lovely. So, so thank you. I, I just wanted to pick up on that just for the moment. Um, so so you, you mentioned, Mac, about the, the everyone getting the cost, the operational efficiency, and so on. But I just started to allude towards the other dynamic, which is there is a drive to try and do whatever you can, whatever anyone can, to actually relieve the pressure that's on liquidity, increase collateral velocity, do something actually around benefiting the market as well in terms of growing it and expanding and making capital more freely available. But you've got that dilemma. You're trying to do that now and address multi-asset classes and address competition against others. Where, how, do you, how do you look at that? How do you get, how do you get the balance? Well, I, don't, I know that there's a, a post-trade session after this, and I don't want to steal their thunder, but Johan briefly mentioned as well. I mean, I think a lot of the focus right now that certainly that we see or we're involved in is in the post-trade side, where the ability to handle cross-asset environment, look at, uh, at risk, um, at, at a place, uh, at any kind of CCP, frankly, but even LCH is, is the one we're working with. But the, the ability to unlock that, that uh, cross-asset real-time picture intraday um, is going to unlock amazing margin and collateral benefits. You know, and, and then again, being able to then, with pre-trade risk management, I mean, we're really looking at our roadmap of integrating our trading infrastructure and our post-trade infrastructure for clients and allow this pre-trade view of risk to come in. And so that, again, when you have a holistic view um, across, uh, you know, for portfolio margin and everything else, I think that's going to unlock a lot of capital and a, and a lot of efficiencies. And so we're, we're focused on working with our clients on helping them get that, again, cross-asset view and on the trading side and post-trade. And, and together that really, I think, will be a, a huge benefit in the years to come. That's great. Thank you for that. And uh, Chris and Haranda, your, your perspectives on, on, on this. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, uh, you know, we, I mean, what we did, I mean, we're agile. I mean, we're, we're multi-asset. We can run in any language in the world, right, with this, uh, and, you know, smartphones, tablets. Uh, we, we even link what we do to the, um, uh, to, to the iWatch, right? But, but the thing is, that's all great, but ultimately, it's about the business model. In, in, in the markets that we go into and the clients that we work with. Um, and for us, it's important. I mean, I think the traditional vendor relationship, sort of customer supply relationship is dying now. I, I mean, certainly um, we want to engage with clients that expect a lot more. And, and typically when we'll go into uh, a marketplace, it's not just about putting the technology in. Of course, we, we will look at ways of monetizing that. You know, that could be sort of aligning interest in different ways, not necessarily always cash. It could be equity, revenue sharing, a whole raft of things where actually in many ways we might want to share in the upside of building the market and building that liquidity. So typically what we're doing is being a bit more selective. I mean, in the early days, you can't. You can, you're kind of striving towards revenues and you got to hit bottom line as a, as a startup. But now a number of years in, you're kind of going, all right, what bets do we need to make? And actually, how do they all come together and synergize? But ultimately, how do we make these things work uh, on a case-by-case -case basis? And that's actually a business problem that you have to solve first and foremost. And then the technology lends itself to that. Because yes, you know, can we put in multiple asset classes? Can we put in a range of trading models? You know, can, we, um, can we do a lot of interesting things? Yes, we can. But actually, you know, if it's a very, very tiny market, let's say you know, where, where we've launched the first uh, market working with the government and stakeholders in Tajikistan. They don't need any of that because actually their first problem is actually how do we get our first listings and is that corporate bonds, is that government bonds, um, you know, is that kind of SMEs that are listing and you've got to solve that problem first before, you know, the floodgates to liquidity open. But actually what, what we're looking at there is, I mean, we kind of look at some of the constructs market to market and actually there is an opportunity uh, in alternative asset classes. So, you know, that might be uh, you know, you're not going to kind of massively reinvent the wheel, but it could be a type of bond, for example, on a completely different underlying that, that has more reason to exist and be listed there as opposed to listed in London or, or elsewhere. So that, that's the kind of approach that we're taking. But in, increasingly, I think, uh, you know, organizations are just tired of 
that great, you know, the vendor walks away with a ton of cash. We've still got tumbleweed blowing through our exchange. And actually, we've spent millions of dollars on technology, but actually, we've got no liquidity. Uh, and actually, the business model in its own right isn't really viable anymore. So, uh, you know, that really does need to be solved. And you've got to really align interests. Otherwise, it's just a one-way street. I think that's a, that's a really great point is, and we're seeing this as well, um, the traditional buyer-seller relationship, the vendor to the customer relationship has changed just dramatically. It, it isn't a, you know, the case of the software vendor coming in, dropping in a load of software, getting their check, thank you very much, we'll see you. But when you call me, I'm gonna charge you for professional services. That model's dead uh, and has been dead for a number of years. The customers that we engage with, and I know other fintech firms are starting to engage with, is far more of a partnership. You have to select the customers that you want. And that sounds like a really strange thing to say, right? But you select the customers. You go after the customers that get it, that get what you're trying to sell, yeah. that recognize that they have a need for the thing that you're trying to sell, and those are the guys that you want to partner with. And, and by partner, I mean genuinely, they can call you up and you're a trusted advisor to them about how their businesses should be developing and you, you don't charge them for that in a professional services way, you just work with them and they're your, they're your customers. So in some ways I see FinTech of the future being uh, far more informal than perhaps software sales have been in this industry in the past and far more collaborative from a customer's perspective and therefore, by the way, far more sticky as well yeah. because the customer values that relationship. Yeah, that's, that's been the move to you know look at agile, and that's been it's not just the SDLC, it's been the, the business model. Well, the last two or three years again, I mean, I think we've seen across the industry where clients actually want to do that. Right? Right. It's not just about how we're developing software; it's it's more the engagement. So, yeah. I mean, this is an interesting one because I mean we were with one potential um, sort of prospect that they're, they're launching a new market, and they were saying, well, actually, we might have an idea of what may work you know, what may not, but actually when push comes to shove, we, we don't really know how it will play out actually, and we might want to try a number of things before we hit upon the right one. So we want the flexibility to do that and not be constrained and not having to come back to, let's say, a vendor, and then it'll take six months or nine months to deliver uh, all, all over again. You know, we want, um, we want our business model to be agile, and then we want, right. you know, we want the partnerships, whether it's on the vendor side or elsewhere, to, to kind of integrate into that. Uh, because, I mean, gone are the days where, you know, you've got this kind of static, dull exchange environment. You know, I've been in this environment <laughs> on the electronic trading sort of exchange light side for 20 years now. And actually, there's more change now than ever before. Um, and to a faster time scale. Uh, and actually, whether it's clients or the street, people are more and more impatient. I mean, this is, this is what one of what, one of the unintended consequences you know we're, we're kind of used to in our personal lives is you're saying new technology all the time but actually even now you know for kind of wholesale products or or offerings i mean people want it yesterday so uh, it's you know how do you adapt to that and people are ever more demanding and informed even in some of these smaller markets where you'd expect them not to be but actually they've been peddled rubbish for all too long and, and, uh, and actually now they're waking up to that and, and getting wiser to it as well. So, so if, we, if we take that a step further then and look at it from a cultural point of view and a conduct point of view, you're saying that, that the engagement between the technology providers, the fintechs, all the established players, and the exchanges providing technology and the existing clients, that, now that's changed shape, yeah. but you've got, you've got the challenge that you want them to you, you want to make your offering as attractive as possible across the whole suite of assets that they want to trade. At the same time, you know that there's a concern, and I think there's more on the fintech side, that if they, they, they can't bet the book with you only. They've got yeah, to have exactly. optionality. They've got to be able to, to, to turn around and say, you can either deliver or you can't. I yeah. can't afford to have my business tied to your success. How, yeah. how do you get that balance right? I think it's about access to decision makers inside of the firm, right? So w some of our customers are very small customers, and they are startups themselves, and some of them are very large customers who are willing to take a, a bet on a smaller company like us. Um, the fact that we are in constant conversation with them about, you know, what does your technology do, and how can it solve this product, that product, um, helps us develop our products 
Okay, before I started this company, I was actually a product manager for SunGuard, amongst other people. And you know, the one thing that I was always taught as a product manager is you must go out and you must talk to the customer about what their problems are and solve their problems. The closer the relationship between the customer and the vendor, the better that information flows and the better you are to create better tools for your customer. It doesn't matter whether you're selling the matching engines or clearing systems or onboarding tools, it just generally doesn't matter. The closer the relationship with the customer, the better the end result. And I think the, the fintech firms who do that successfully will be the ones who win. Yeah, it's a different sort of sale because, I mean, we, we as I say, I mean, being a smaller firm, albeit growing, I mean, we, we tend to focus, be very focused on pipeline and, and the things that we do because, again, you can't afford to, I mean, this, the sales cycle typically or, or what you're doing is quite long you know, as, as Mac had know, and you can't afford to kind of expend lots of resources on something for nothing that might not materialize. So, you know, this is where kind of alignment is important and moving away from just, um, uh, you know, I guess a door-to-door -door salesman that's, that, that's, that's just coming in and, you know, selling on price and, and functionality. It, it's got to be much more than that. But you're actually right, you know, on, on the client side, whilst firms want to reduce costs and they want synergies, I mean, increasingly, they're employing a range of options and trying to integrate them. I mean, it's no different to what we're doing. So we're, we're strong in certain areas, but in other areas, we think, all right, there's no point expending resource there to reinvent the wheel. So we'll bring in smaller partners and then um, integrate that into what we're doing. And it's a much more compelling offering, and you're specializing in what you're doing. But equally, you know, if we look at, um, and not to keep harping back to that, but if we look at some of the work talent, they, they, they had internal systems, uh, they, they had kind of third party front ends, um, and then they had new components with us that they need to needed to develop and some existing technology. And uh, to deliver this effectively, it's been a marriage of all those uh, collectively to make it work um, because there wasn't kind of no one size fitted all solution. I mean, they needed something very much tailored to the way that they wanted to do business, uh, but, but also in a way that was cost effective and scaled well as well. Got it. Thank you for that. And, and, and Matt, what, what are you facing? And, and also, do you see yourselves as a fintech, or do you see yourselves as a long-established firm, or what, what is the culture? Well, you know what's great about uh, we're all fintech now. We can all call ourselves fintech, <laughs> right? financial technology. I mean, like, we think, look, we're, you know, we, um, we have been, we have an established platform, but we are, you know, we continue to do a lot of R&D on uh, machine learning, on hardware accelerations. I, I think we actually tend to inhabit kind of a middle ground, uh, just by the nature of the company and, and uh, the, what, what Millennium does. But again, I, I do chuck a little bit because we all seem to be fintech uh, these days. No matter if, <laughs> if there was something from SunGuard here or FIS, they would be fintech as well. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I, I was, I was, but, at, a, uh, I was yeah. at a meeting yesterday where somebody said, uh, "If you're a CTO and you haven't got cloud on your CV, you've got to do something about it." Yeah. Yeah. So I. So, but back to, to, to the interesting point on, we're talking cross-asset, mm -hmm. but by definition, as you standardize, you are creating more risk, operational risk, business risk with a vendor, what, what have you. And I, I do think that over time, there will be some winners and losers, you know, because not every architecture can scale to handle global 24-7, highly liquid markets across, you know, a, a range of, of, you know, the most liquid asset classes. And, and um, again, given volumes, given the uh, increasing complexity of the markets that we support, again, not every platform can do that. So I, I do think we will see winners and losers continue to emerge in the next couple of years on who can truly provide, uh, again, for low latency, uptime, and all the attributes you have, to, you know, the table stakes just to get into the business, uh, but then can handle that, uh, that scale. And so it's interesting dynamic in, in the market right now. But again, we will con we'll continue to see new entrants on the margin, right, for less liquid assets, for things that need to be more flexible, and, and, and ex in exchanges and sell-side institutions will continue to make bets and hedge their bets. And, so, and there will be yeah. that fluidity, but um, I, th I think we can, we'll start to see some clear winners emerge in the next year or two on who actually can provide the kind of throughput and the kind of scalability for, for a global market. And I guess that also comes back to who gets that balance right of what should run on a mainframe, what shouldn't, what should be on the new technology, and how you get that, that, that overall delivery balance right in terms of the product set. 
while the market is demand, demand is changing. Mm. Now, I'm just going to throw it open to, to our audience uh, if we have any uh, questions that people would like to raise. Unfortunately, the light shining at us means we can't see very much. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Good to know. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the floor at the moment? No? OK. Um, no, that's fine. So let's, let's then take that one step, one step further forward. In terms of the way that you're saying the market, the market is having to, the demand for the market has been forced to change. Everyone understands where the key drivers are that are sitting behind it. How do you actually reflect the different demands of each of the asset classes in determining where you need to put, which, which, which attributes are the most suitable? What's, what's the deciding factor? Because each part of the trading desk is going to have its own demands, yeah. and yet they're expecting you to get it right. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you balance that up? I mean, it's been somewhat easier for us because, I mean, every few years when, when, when we look at this sort of thing, we start with a clean sheet of paper, actually. Because what, what we've seen out there is, I mean, there's, there's firms that say they have new technology, but actually it's not, you know, they might have optimized what they're doing and they throw more hardware at it. And um, not to mention a, any names names out there, but well, actually one of them's just left on, on an airplane, but they've got, I can't help myself, but they, they, they've got technology that's, you know, 20 to 25 years old, you know, that we were running when I first started out, but fundamentally the design of that technology hasn't changed. So changes to that are agile, uh, and it's not responsive, but equally what you've got out there is you've got primarily cash equities platforms, uh, you know, because that's where kind of the electronic trading revolution started that are being adapted for other asset classes, but it's square peg, round, hole. Um, and so, you know, when, when we looked at this, I mean, we, we realized that a, a, a few years back and we created a genuinely flexible data and reference model that lends itself to any asset class and is truly asset class agnostic. I mean, we're not saying that we've demonstrated that, which means that you can set up things very, very quickly, make things very highly configurable, um, even things like surveillance alerts. And then, you know, as far as the client's concerned, I mean, for us, uh, you know, if it lends itself to a certain trading model that we support, um, we don't really care what it is. You know, I mean, again, uh, recently um, we were kind of doing a study and we, we added um, some commodities instruments and 50 million of them, many of them one-off types. And that was during the course of this study during a week, um, you know, with their data mapped. It's, it, 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 order of magnitude, it's much faster now in terms of, uh, in terms of delivery. And what you find is a bottleneck is ultimately um, client connectivity to third-party systems. And when you're putting it in uh, to uh, an exchange, but because obviously they've got more complex processes. Um, and so it's then, you know, how does your agile means of delivery, your flexibility, then marry up with what you said, you know, Martin, with mainframe or antiquated ways of doing things. Uh, and that's, that's where some of the challenges arise that you've then got to address as well. Thank you. Anything to add, uh, Mac or Chris? I, I, think, I think it goes back to having a strong kind of product vision, right? So what Hernandez just mentioned about, you know, you build it once from a, a blank sheet of paper and you make it sure that it's nice and flexible for anything that might come along in the future. I think that's really the core, right? Um, anybody who has a legacy mainframe where the guy who built it is now left or retired, uh, you know, that's not going to be flexible. People who are building and investing in new technology and constantly updating that um, will be reinventing their product again and again. Uh, and as long as they, as long as they uh, avoid the hacks themselves <laughs> uh, and think about you know, a strong product vision and a strong uh, understanding of where the market needs to go and what they need to support, I think it'll be fine. So. Yeah, I, I think, I think Harander hit the point exactly. Either, either your system is designed from the ground up from the very beginning mm -hmm. as multi-asset, multi-market, et cetera, or it's not. And you know, some systems are, some systems aren't. It's as simple as that. And they, back to my earlier point, there will be, I think, an emergence of those systems, again, that are getting more market share, that were designed from the beginning like that, and that can handle the kind of environment we're talking about, and others that, that will fail. One, one thing I'd just say in terms of selection of technology, because it's always fascinated me, is if, if you walk into, into a bank 
going to uh, an exchange and you, you canvass the type of development skills that they have on staff, you hear the same thing again and again. Java, C++, .NET. Mm. Great. Outside the office, where is all of the technology? <laughs> it's all web technology. Right? Mm. I mean, it's all on our phone. It's all, you yeah. know. But banks and exchanges appear to have pretty much zero web capability. They don't even build their own websites. That, even that's outsourced, right? Yeah. So, you know, web is an incredibly agile technology when you actually use it, and we use it at our core. That's one of the main reasons why we are as agile as we are. But, but people just seem to have completely ignored that entire swathe of technology, which, which um, is very confusing to me. I mean, this is interesting, actually, because, yeah, I mean, when we first came across that, because we thought, all right, great, you know, we're used to being really wired here, uh, you, you know, with a range of apps on our phone, yet yeah, actually exchanges are way behind the curve because you've got lots and lots of locally deployed technology, you, you know, kind of managed service, cloud-based delivery on the exchange side is, is a rarity, albeit some of the newer markets or marketplaces might try that. But really, it's technology deployed standalone on, a, on an island, so it doesn't matter, you know, I mean, we've got some firms that, that might be going around going, yeah, great, you know, our technology, we've got X number of reference sites. It doesn't really matter because they're not, they're not interconnected and actually the code base is branched off as well uh, and managing that becomes really difficult. And then when we kind of asked exchanges, you know, why do you want to do that? Some of it's nationalism, you know, they kind of want to maintain the market uh, and it doesn't matter if the office is there, but they want to see the system running there, there as well. Some of it is concerns around security that don't necessarily exist because even the web, you know, into that you can build secure nodes and, and cloud-based, more private type net networks for aspects of that. Obviously, you still need external access. But there's some of these concerns that still exist and actually we've moved on from there to, to, to a large degree. But actually the exchanges, um, because of that kind of suspicion, haven't necessarily followed suit no, thank you for that. And uh, conscious on, on where we are with time, I mean, uh, you've covered quite a breadth. It also seems to come back that there are, there are key areas where cultural changes, intimacy with, with clients, and actually getting that balance right, looking at the right technology in the right place, and also the interlinkage of all the different systems, which in itself also is a, a place where you can see that there's a risk from a business perspective, but also an opportunity to excel, because the more you can get through the pipes, the better. I just want to, um, I just want to come with a very quick um, update from each of you in terms of, or, or point of view from each of you in terms of, are we going to see that the established order management systems, enterprise management systems, current providers are going to be the ones who've got better chance because they've got the flow of succeeding in the future? Or do we see that actually we're going to actually see the, the new startups, the new organizations who are coming in without the legacy issues to deal with, but also without the flow? So they're going to have to win. Very much, one might even say, a Clinton and Trump type. So, Haranda, which way are you going to vote? Who's going to get most of the market share in the future? Well, actually, I mean, you're absolutely right, Martin, because actually when, when you first start a business, you know, someone kind of said to me, right, you're heading towards the edge of that cliff and it's whether you can slow down or turn around just in time and the bane of every entrepreneur, you're always hunting for cash. So, yeah, you're right. Um, you know, sort of, uh, I've seen some great technology out there where, you know, even on the distributed ledger side, you've got, um, you've got some larger firms investing in what I'd say inferior technology, but the great technologists are really bad salesmen. And so they're getting no traction at all. So you're right, you know, and so to, to survive, I mean, it's, it's about partnerships with them. And in some cases, it's partnering. So I think the answer is kind of almost a hung vote to some degree, because you've got some of these firms then partnering with the big, bigger ones um, and uh, some of the other ones, you know, trying to break through without selling the kitchen sink, a bit like TomTom Tom did, you know, when they launched, it was a great product. They could have got it into every car manufacturer, okay. yet they did a deal with Renault, and that but, was it. But, Haranda, in yeah. the interest of time, yeah. which way is Florida going to vote? So, I, I think it's going, to be a com it's going to be a combination of both. There is room for some of the larger vendors, um, but there's also room, some of the smaller ones will succeed. Eight out of ten may fail. And then, uh, and then, you know, out of those two that succeed, you know, half of them will be because they partner with larger firms, and, and the other half, but you know, just because they've broken through that wall. 
So that's, so that's going to be quite a mix, which is a problem yeah. for, the, for, for, for the member firms as well. Chris? Well, to, to quote Donald Trump, the system is rigged, right? <laughs> uh, and, and what I mean by that is small, nimble startups often have the better product, but are not the ones who get chosen because they're small. Right? And you know, we see this all the time. Getting through procurement is an absolute nightmare. It's got nothing to do with your technology at all. It's just the size of your company. So if you're a small company, you may have a much better product, but you might not, not win. You're, you're definitely the underdog. It doesn't matter what you're happens. Definitely the underdog. Thank you for that. And, and given that we've managed to get Wallonia to agree with a Canadian trade deal, <laughs> where do you sit, Mac? Let me take a different slant at it. You talked about sell side. I think that there, there's a lot of vendors out there um, in that space, underfunded on the tech for the last 10, 15 years, yeah. and certainly post-crisis. Um, on the other hand, and at the risk of talking my own book, I see a lot of cutting edge technology in the market infrastructure space, in the exchange space, which I think is highly relevant to the sell side. And we see flow <laughs> coming towards the exchanges. I actually see an inverse flow of technology out to the sell side in the next couple of years. So I think that's a trend that we're going to see. And back to, you know, there will be established vendors. And as my earlier point, I think they're going to, you know, the ones that can handle are going to get a lot more business. But there will be new startups, no question. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's, that's just a healthy ecosystem. No, thank you for that. And I think that also identifies quite clearly the challenge that financial institutions have got going forward, getting down to a single book for a multi-asset class or a single trading system, and also addressing all the other elements that, that technology is bringing, be it fintech, be it the established players, be it mainframe. I like that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation for the panel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martin. If, uh, if you could just swap your mics over, that would be good. It is very interesting. I mean, I spend a lot of time teaching people to sell here and in America, and it is staggering how many people are still stuck with the old 20th century way of selling when you're trying to communicate your value. Uh, they're still doing, you know, they go straight in with the demo, they go straight in with the proposal, they go straight in with the PowerPoint. If you want your customers to very quickly ask you how much all this is going to cost, carry on doing that. We're, we're now through the days of communicating the value. Our job now, when we're in a sales mode, is to create value, which is a completely different way of selling. Anyway, um, as you all liked so much the uh, electronic way of, uh, of assessing markets uh, and the way they are at the moment, we've got a second one for you just while the microphones are being swapped over. So once again, I'd like you to refer to your um, iPads, which you've got in front of you. Again, you'll be asked one, two, or three questions. So this time. So I'll give you 15 seconds to have a look at that. Vote now, as they say. And uh, yes, we'll let you have a look at that. Let's see which one's come out. Joey? Yeah. Oh. Stage lights. And I think we might even have a second one of those. Have we got two? So again, another 10, 15 seconds. You can give it a whirl. And let's hope everybody has voted. If you voted, vote now. And let's have a look, see what the result was. Ah. I think Donald Trump was probably more interested in becoming president. What he's going to do with it now, I mean, God only knows. Okay. This is the last.